Well, our next talk is about to start. We have Zishan talking about resolving out of memory issues in beam pipelines. This is a topic near and dear to my heart when I help debug pipelines. So I'm really excited to see what he has to say. Take it away. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for uh, coming for this talk. Uh, my name is Zishan, and I work as a cloud data engineer with Google Cloud Consulting. And um, today I'll be talking about how you can resolve out of memory issues and also some of the best practices that you can do to write uh, memory efficient pipelines. And then at the last, I'll also touch upon some options you have in Dataflow to uh, provide larger memory capacity if your pi pipeline is memory intensive. So uh, before I begin, I want to give an overview of uh, the memory usage. Uh, this is specific for Dataflow, but it should be valid for most runners. Uh, so what uh, we can do here is that I have sort of categorized memory usage into three categories, uh, which are shown in three different colors, uh, green, yellow, and blue. And um, not, all these mem all, not all the memory that's available, uh, users can actually have a lot of control over that. So. Um, and I'll touch upon where users can do what to improve the uh, memory utilization, what is available on the worker. And this memory sort of usage is there for uh, a Beam SDK process. Um, now, in Dataflow world, you can have um, more than one Beam SDK process, specific for Python, for example, where you can have one SDK process per vCPU. And depending on the number of vCPUs in the worker, you can have multiple SDK processes. For Java, it's straightforward. It is one SDK process per worker. So um, starting with the first category of sort of memory usage is the what we call as the worker operational memory. Uh, this is a fairly small amount of memory, less than one GB, that is used by uh, the operating system and some system processes. And there isn't much that users can do or developers can do in the pipeline to sort of improve this or control this. The Next category of memory usage, usage comes from what we call as the SDK process memory. And this is the memory that is consumed by in-memory objects and data. And uh, these objects and data are shared across two FNs within the same SDK process. So for example, um, in this diagram, we see that uh, the yellow portion of the memory is accessible to a bunch of do FNs that are running concurrently. And uh, the question then comes that what consumes or what, uh, what things consume this sort of memory? So these are things like side inputs. So for example, side inputs are additional inputs that you can provide uh, within your do FN. Then if you're loaded, loading an ML model, for example, so that also consumes the SDK process memory. Um, so uh, let's say, for example, if you are loading an ML model uh, for a Python job, and Python jobs have uh, one SDK process for each vCPU, and there are, let's say, four vCPUs on a worker, you would have four copies of that ML model. Uh, so just to be mindful of how things work in Dataflow and, um, and other runners, that um, for example, if your ML model is fairly large, you may have multiple copies of that model for each vCPU uh, and each SDK process on that vCPU. The other thing is um, in-memory singletons. So these are also in-memory objects that uh, we all can also bucket together within the SDK process memory. And then uh, Python objects that are created using the shared module. So there is a module um, in the Python Beam SDK where you can create some objects, and those objects are uh, shared across the do FNs within a SDK process. Um, any questions so far? Yes, exactly. So all we see here is for one SDK process. Um, it's easier to translate it for Java pipelines because there is one SDK process in Java. For Python, there is uh, one SDK process per vCPU. All right. Um, now, the next uh, 
memory usage, uh, which comes from, uh, is actually, actually the DoFN. So DoFN is um, a Beam SDK class that is used to define a distributed processing function. And this is where your uh, processing logic lies. So if your pipeline is memory intensive, that should be the typically the maximum usage of, um, of the worker memory. Now, in this example I've shown, there are four DoFNs and each of them consumes similar amount of memory. But in a real world scenario, you can have um, hundreds of DoFNs running concurrently. So anything that you have defined or are you doing within a DoFN is being, is being replicated and done n number of times depending on the number of DoFNs that are there. And the number of DoFNs that are there on the worker depends on the number of threads that runner creates. So uh, the default values for data flow may not be the same as for other runners. Um, so once we have these different memory usage, um, uh, this is this was all about for each SDK process. And like I mentioned, for Java, there is one SDK process per worker. And for Python, there is one SDK process for each vCPU. So all the things that you see here will de depend on the number of SDK processes, essentially. So just to be mindful of how the memory uh, usage works. Now, the in the next few slides, I will just... Um, talk about some of the best practices that you can do to write memory efficient pipelines. And these are the things that will affect the yellow and the green memory categories. So you can't do much about the blue memory category, but you can do some things in your Beam code to make an efficient use of memory that's available. So the first thing is that um, if you're trying to read a file, always use the Beam built-in I.O. Uh, this is something that I've seen with a lot of uh, new Beam developers that they want to, uh, let's say, do some lookup or um, do some analysis, and they would just read read a file within a DoFN. So, for example, here we see that we have an input P collection, and then we are applying a P transform, <coughs> and within that DoFN, we are opening a file. Uh, so, the problem here is that. Because there'll be hundreds of DoFNs, you are essentially having hundreds and copies of that same file. And if that file is large, you can easily blow up the memory capacity. So if you have a use case where you have to open a file, always use the Apache Beam SDK, uh, the Beam built-in uh, IO connectors. Um, and if the file size is fairly small, you could potentially do it, but the caveat here is that uh, there'll be multiple copies of this files, and then you're also reading from that source system hundreds and thousands of times. So it's an anti-pattern. Um, the next is on uh, thinking about operations or transforms that you do after a group by key transform. So Group by key transform is a very fundamental P transform in the Beam world, which essentially uh, groups key value pairs. Um, so sorry, it, it groups values that share the same key uh, for each window. So the way it looks like is this: so we have an input P collection, which is a key value pair of strings, and once you perform a group by key P transform, you get a uh, a value which is this sorry a key which is uh, the common key, and then the i triple of values that share that same key. So up till this point, things are good because um, depending, like even if you're, if, if there, you know, if, even if there are millions of records that have the same key, you would get an i triple. So it's not important that all those values should, should fit in worker's memory. But what you do after this can cause or create problems. So for example, if you are, trying to collect all this, uh, all these values into an in-memory object, let's say list, to maybe do some processing or some computation, you can easily blow up the memory capacity. So, um, so, so what you can do here is that you can uh, maybe have a smaller uh, batch sizes, so you could maybe have some windowing function, which is smaller batch size, so that in each batch or in the the each I triple that you get is a fairly small uh, a number of elements and that can easily fit in workers' uh, memory. Um, the next is on um, 
reducing the ingress data from external sources. So within the beam pipelines, it's a very common practice to um, sort of look up data from external systems, API, and you can be bringing some data from those systems within data flow. Now, when we are doing these kinds of lookups or uh, calls, it's always recommended that we batch these requests because uh, not only these requests are expensive, but it also adds latency. Uh, and also it doesn't over um, sort of burdens the external system because Dataflow can spin up a many number of calls like this. So when we are trying to batch these calls, um, there is a Beam method called group into batches that you can use to create a batch sizes of fixed size. And for each of these uh, lookups for each batch, that data has to fit in worker's memory. Now, as I mentioned, because you're ha having multiple threads, uh, you may have multiple batches of requests being made. And all that data from all these requests should be fitting in the memory. And if that doesn't happen, you would run into out of memory issues. So one quick way to fix this is to maybe reduce the batch size so that the amount of data that you're ingressing in the worker at one particular point in time is something that's, that fits in the worker's memory. So that's the um, third point. Um, then um, the, the, the next point is on using some caching mechanism. So, for example, for each DoFN, there are multiple methods that uh, that that are executed at different stages of the DoFN lifecycle. So, starting with setup method, then start bundle, process, finish bundle, and tear down. And anything that you create in any of these methods is going to be created for each DoFN. So, this means that it will consume the the memory which is colored in green. And like I mentioned, because there can be 100 of uh, such 2FNs, you can have 100 copies or hundreds of copies of those in uh, objects or, uh, or data. Now, the Python Beam SDK provides a library called the shared library uh, that can be used to create singletons. And these singletons um, are essentially shared across the same SDK. So this means that um, if, if you create a list, let's say if you create a list within a DoFN, that list will be created for each DoFN. That means uh, in this example, you would be having four copies of that list. But if you create that list using the shared library, there'll be just one copy of that list. So you can reduce that memory footprint by almost one fourth. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, like I mentioned, Dataflow has hundreds of things, so you can reduce it by a few hundredth time. Um, and then all the DoFNs will have access to that um, shared in-memory object. So that's one way of thinking about writing code that is uh, making good use of memory and also a lot of uh, DoFNs can share that uh, object. So um, the... Next thing that I'm going to touch upon is um, how, what options do you have in Dataflow to make more memory available? So if you have written a Beam pipeline and it's following some of these best practices and um, it is uh, making good use of the memory and still you are running out of memory issues, that means you essentially need inherently more memory capacity. Um, so I'll touch upon what options you can do in the data flow um, that can make more memory available on the worker. So the first one is fairly simple. Uh, you would essentially select a machine type which has more memory per vCPU. Um, so this means that let's say if you have a worker which has, uh, let's say four, four GB per vCPU, you would essentially select a worker, let's say with six GB uh, memory per vCPU. And of course, uh, the total memory capacity of the worker would also increase. So in this way, you would have more rem memory that's available for uh, the DoFNs and for um, SDK in-memory objects and things like that. The second option is to select a machine type which has more vCPUs. And this is not applicable for Python Beam jobs. So if you do this thing for Python Beam jobs, 
you wouldn't gain anything. Um, now, the idea here, and the reason why it's like that is that, uh, like I mentioned, for Java and Go pipelines, you would have uh, one SDK process uh, for each worker. And uh, if you increase the number of uh, vCPUs on the worker, they, the vCPUs also come with more memory capacity. So you end up getting more memory available for each SDK process. Unlike Python, uh, if you have, let's say, a Python job, there is one SDK process per vCPU. So let's say you have a worker that has four core machine, four vCPUs, and you add a, you you replace that with a new worker which has let's say eight vCPUs. The memory per vCPU is going to be the same. That means the memory per SDK process is going to be the same. So in this case, uh, this would not work if you have a Python job. Um, the next is on um, on sort of controlling the number of um, harness threads. So Dataflow provides this flag called the number of worker harness thread. So when you're launching the job, you can specify a count to this value. And uh, this essentially controls the amount of, or, or the number of threads that Dataflow creates per SDK process. Uh, there are default values for, for these, and that depends on if it's a streaming job or a bad job, if it's a Python, Java, or uh, SDK, there, on the documentation page, there is a table that you can see what these default values are. But the idea here is that uh, developers can control uh, what is the default number of threads that Dataflow creates. And uh, we should only try this thing if you have tried the above two options. So only if you, the above two options are not working for your use case, you should uh, you can explore this option where you can change the number of threads and that essentially um, makes more memory available per uh, per thread or per do fn and uh, for the use case of out of memory you would essentially reduce this value to uh, the, the you will set this value to a value that's less than the default values so you would not increase it because in that case you would need more memory uh, the other option, um, and this is applicable for Python jobs, um, is to only create one SDK process like we have it in Java. Um, and this option exists. Uh, that's why I have mentioned it here, but it is something that uh, should be only tried if the above three options don't work. So only if the above three options you have tried and they're not working, would you sort of potentially consider this. And the reason why it's not recommended is that when we are sort of creating one SDK process, sorry, you're like, so, uh, so uh, in Python, if you're creating one SDK process for each worker, you're not using the other cores that are there on the machine. So you are still paying for the vCPUs, but those CPUs are not doing any computation. So it's an expensive way of making memory available. Uh, yeah, go ahead sense in that case sorry would it make more sense in that case just to use a custom machine type that had you know a small number of cores and a large large amount of memory yes you can do that but if you're setting this flag those cores would not be used so um, and what you described is would be the option of I think the first option is if a custom machine type you select a worker which has more memory capacity per vCPU um, and the third, um, and this is a fairly new uh, sort of feature that Dataflow offers, and uh, no other runner offers this at the moment. Um, and this is using the vertical order scaling in Dataflow. So it's a new capability uh, within Dataflow that can automatically scale the memory capacity of your workers based on out of memory issues. So it's a reactive approach. So let's say if you have a worker configuration where Dataflow observes that there are some out of memory errors. It will replace those workers automatically, seamlessly, without any intervention required from the developer or uh, the admin, and replace the workers with uh, workers that have higher memory per vCPU. Uh, 
and it's an iterative process. So this will happen if the out of memory error happen again, it will increase the memory capacity again and will continue. There are some default upper and lower limits um, and the same thing happens for downscaling. So if you have a memory capacity, if you have a job that is not using a lot of memory, um, there's no need for you to pay for that memory and it will downscale the memory capacity on the workers um, and saving a little bit on your cost. Um, so it, it, it's something that we can do in an automated way. But um, all these methods where we are trying to make more memory available on the worker should be tried if we have already written a very efficient beam pipeline. Because if your pipeline itself is not efficient, no matter the amount of memory you make available, will you will still end up with that same problem. So, um, so, so yeah, uh, b before we sort of try to make more memory available, uh, the first option would be to make sure that the code is essentially uh, making good use of memory. And um, in my experience working with several customers, uh, a lot of these problems are actually coming from something in the code which is not making good use of memory or has an anti-pattern. And uh, no matter the amount of memory you make available or uh, the kind of workers you use, you will still end up with those problems. So with that, um, I want to say a special thank you for some of my colleagues who I worked with. Um, and we have published a guide on the data for documentation page that talks about um, all these things that I've covered and also goes into a lot more detail on some of the things. So um, if you're running into out of memory issues on Dataflow, feel free to take a read. Um, and um, uh, I'm more than happy to answer any questions if you have.